Hare Krishna. Welcome to our continuing series, which has turned out to have the theme from Bhava to Bhava. We cover topics about material existence. We can all agree that we're stuck in material existence. And we also try to stimulate the appetite for bhava. We want to rise in our bhakti so that our attachment for Krishna increases. Bhakti involves two things. Understanding the reality of material existence and understanding Krishna. Material existence, of course, is Krishna's energy. But it's not the energy that we want to be in, nor is it the energy that Krishna wants us to be in. We'll start tonight with a verse recited by Queen Kunti who played the role of Krishna's aunt. First Canto, Chapter 8, Text 35. Bhavesman klishyamananam avijja kama karma bhi shavana smarana hani krishyaniti kechana And yet others say that you appeared to rejuvenate the devotional service of hearing, remembering, worshipping, and so on, in order that the conditioned souls suffering from material pangs might take advantage and gain liberation. In part of the purport, Srila Prabhupada writes, The Lord, however, out of his causeless mercy, because he's more merciful to the suffering living beings than they can expect, appears before them and renovates the principles of devotional service, comprised of hearing, chanting, remembering, serving, worshiping, praying, cooperating, and surrendering unto him. Adoption of all the above mentioned items, or any one of them, can help a conditioned soul get out of the tangle of nescience and thus become liberated from all material sufferings created by the living being, illusion by the external energy. This particular type of mercy is bestowed upon the living being by the Lord in the form of Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. I want to focus on this characteristic of Krishna because sometimes amidst this current pandemic crisis, people ask, where is God amidst all this? When times are good, meaning the material happiness seems to be rewarding, temporarily satisfying and gratifying, no one's begging for the presence of God. But when the inevitable reactions happen, then where is God? What is he going to do? It's sad. In this purport, Srila Prabhupada points out, Krishna is more merciful to the suffering living beings than they can expect. Say, okay, where is the mercy? More than we can expect? Let's look at the Sanskrit. Bhave, excuse me, Bhavesmin klishyamananam avijja kama karma bhi. We're struggling in material existence in Bhava, the ocean of repeated birth and death. 
How does that struggle look? It's composed of components, just as Kunti Devi has mentioned. Avidya Kama Karma B. Avidya Nessens. That's number one in the cycle. Nessens brings about Kama, perverted desire, materialistic desire. And that perverted desire results in karma, materialistic activities, which of course, as you know, produce material reactions. And in this way, the living entity is entangled, bound. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna mentions how the conditioned soul is bound, bewildered by the nescience, the avidya that covers the knowledge. So you may be wondering, why do human beings make the same mistakes again and again? The old mantra I learned while studying history at the university. The only thing that human beings learn by studying history is that no one ever learns by studying history. They make the same mistake again and again. Sometimes we smack our heads. Why? Can't anyone see what the problem is? Whether you're a spiritualist or a materialist, you get frustrated. Don't they see this material Remedy will solve the situation, at least temporarily. And bhakti yogis also get frustrated. Doesn't anyone want to get to the root of the problem? Doesn't anyone want to deal with the virus of material existence? Why are we so addicted to struggling unnecessarily? This is the great question that human a real human civilization is meant to face. Bhavesmin klishyamananam avijja karma karma bhi. First nations covers your knowledge just like clouds cover the sun. And then you feel all kinds of artificial perverted desires for material expansion, for material gratification, for material enhancement. The result, material activities, karma. So the question often comes up, when will human beings ever learn? Let's just take the present crisis COVID-19, coronavirus. But first, begin with a nice example about a fly attracted to a piece of toast that's covered with honey. Out of ignorance, meaning limited knowledge, inadequate knowledge. The fly lands on the toast that's covered with honey. And the fly thinks in its own fly way. <laughs> Obviously very limited consciousness. This is nice. This is what I need. What could be better? And of course, very quickly, the reality manifests. The fly is stuck in the honey. And the more it struggles, the more its legs and wings become covered by the honey. At the end of today's presentation, we'll also talk about Baba in relation to 
being stuck in the honey. But that is something else. For now, let's quote, let's focus on Bhava, stuck in material existence. Where is the cure? Let's talk about <clears throat> very juicy subject. Unfortunately, it's all too real for those with material bodies and minds stuck in the material atmosphere. Let's talk about plagues, pandemics. Sometimes people say, oh, the current health crisis is all because of globalization. Germs, microbes, <laughs> pathogens have rapidly spread everywhere because the world is so connected. So the solution is to throw up barriers. Wipe out the disease in your own land. Then you can breathe more easily. But we're dealing with a whole world in such a way that what happens in one part of the world is going to affect another part. We're all in this together as human beings. You may, let's say, wipe out a virus in New Zealand. But if it's still going on in Iran or Angola or someplace like that, the pathogens still have potential to go everywhere. So this Coronavirus crisis, definitely, as many thinkers have pointed out, shows us the need for human cooperation. Human beings should be pooling information to get on top of the whole virus crisis situation. Now, this isn't the first time, by far, that there has been a plague or pandemic crisis. Let's go back to the 14th century. The bubonic plague, black plague, black death spread from East Asia to Europe and in less than 10 years killed between 75 million and 200 million people more than a quarter of the population of Eurasia. In England, that meant four out of 10 people died. For example, in the city of Florence in Italy, 50,000 of the then 100,000 inhabitants met their end. So you might say, well, that's way back in the 1300s. There was not so much knowledge back then. What do you expect? Now is different. We'll move along in history to the year 1520. One single person, his name is even known, Francisco de Higuilla came from Europe and landed in Mexico. His name is still renowned 500 years later because he was the sole carrier of smallpox. Within six months, up to a third of the population of Central America was dead. The inhabitants had no immunity against these European diseases. Okay, that was 500 years ago. Ah, but just about 100 years ago, the so-called Spanish flu.
kill more people. than four years of World War I did. Tens and tens of millions of people, perhaps as high as a hundred million in less than a year. It's estimated that this so-called Spanish flu killed 5% of the population of India. So our point is, that material existence means these things. You stop one, then comes another. So while sympathizing for the suffering of people, we should understand the real problem and have much sympathy for that real problem of material existence, the virus of avidya, which produces karma, which produces karma. It said that, well, back in the time of the 1300s, so-called Black Death, people didn't have knowledge, didn't have information. They blamed diseases on angry gods, malicious demons, bad air. They didn't know about bacteria and viruses. They believed in angels and fairies. <laughs> they couldn't imagine at that time that just one drop of water could contain a whole army of deadly predators. But now we have knowledge. So why is the present situation, the present crisis happening? Well, it's embarrassing for human beings. We've lost our cool. We're no longer the cool species. We have no halo over our head. You've got to start thinking. We can't go back to business as usual. We have to do a deep reevaluation of what is human life meant for. Many of us have already forgotten about the so-called swine flu, which likely originated in an American factory farms. Think way back to the year 2009. I know it's ancient history. Between 2009 and 2010, just in the USA, 12,000 Americans died from the swine flu. And over 274,000 were hospitalized in that same one year. We should think that there's something <clears throat> problematic about the whole package of material existence. Why don't we consider animal revenge, animal retribution, because human beings are unnecessarily exploiting and terrorizing animals. Statistics are that 75% of emerging infectious diseases are what scientists call zoonic. They originate from animals. And these pathogens, these zoonic pathogens, jump to human beings. Why did they get that opportunity to jump? because human beings are inappropriately too intimate with animals, meaning they're too close to animals. By eating them, by having live animal markets, and also by deforesting, 
driving the animals out of their natural habitat by destroying forests and human beings move in. We're terrorizing animals through factory farms, through slaughterhouses, and by destroying their habitat so human beings can have more room. More room for what? Do human beings know what to do with themselves? Many people are surprised to know that, let's just take the U.S. for example. 80% of the antibiotics in the USA are used for animals. And most of these antibiotics could be effective in treating human beings. But the widespread excessive use of these antibiotics in animals to make them disease free so that we can eat them, that widespread usage means that resistance develops. And so there's a great problem in that so many antibiotics formerly safeguarding human health don't work anymore. 80% of antibiotic usage in the USA is for animals, keeping them suitable for eating because the animals are confined in these factory farms and subject to rampant disease. Find political leaders who are talking about the revenge of animals. Animal retribution. What are you human beings doing to us? It's a very important concern. Human beings are living inappropriately. And therefore, nature is responding by inflicting such pain and suffering. We need to face the facts that human beings are living an uncontrolled and dangerous experiment. What makes the experiment known as human society so dangerous? It's because human society is so incompatible with nature. And of course, the bhakti yogis take it even further. Not only is human society incompatible with nature as conventionally known, but also incompatible with the supreme nature. A most dangerous experiment that is showing itself to be disastrous. So it's time that we start talking about this. Often, science-minded persons medicine-minded persons are proud. In the year 2019, there was not one single case in the world reported of smallpox. Just see the victory of contemporary knowledge, contemporary medical science. But, as Srila Prabhupada pointed out, you can't stop a cascade of disease. You block one disease, in comes another. Who would have thought some years ago that there's such a thing as a coronavirus? Therefore, the point we've been stressing is when will we consider the entire material existence as a virus, as a disease? And there is a way to stop this disease in its tracks. Kunti Davies pointing out how 
by Krishna's appearance, he rejuvenates the processes of bhakti. That is Krishna's mercy. Does Krishna have to do anything? Let's talk about that. <laughs> We'll go to the ninth canto, where Pritchett Maharaj is getting ready to hear the tenth canto from Shukadeva Swami. Some of you have heard me speak about this section before. I like it because it's such a stimulant. It is such a mm, appetizer. Shukadeva Swami is giving hints. Guess what's coming? Krishna Leela. He's building up your thirst. We'll start with text 57 of chapter 24, the last chapter of the ninth canto. Nihasya janmano hetu karmano va mehi pate atma mayam vini sasya Parasya Dostur Atmana. O King, Maharaj Bridget, but for the Lord's personal desire, there is no cause for his appearance, disappearance, or activities. As the Super Soul, he knows everything. Consequently, there is no cause that affects him, not even the results of fruitive activities. Everyone knows, I hope, from Bhagavad Gita. Namam karmani limpanti. Name karma balespriya. Krishna says, I've got nothing to achieve. No work affects me. So why then does he come? Out of his merciful compassion. He's not forced to appear. But there's something that we need to tap into in terms of our making the most of our life and helping others to make the most of their life. There is mercy in this world of suffering. We'll be pointing out two aspects. Yes, this world is suffering without a doubt. And yes, there is extraordinary mercy present. Both things are going on. And depending on how we situate ourselves, we get one experience or the other. For the ordinary living being, the body is punishment. For a devotee of Krishna, the body is a vehicle to be engaged in Krishna's service. Maya means differently when Krishna comes. It refers to Krishna in his compassion, in his mercy. I like the way that <clears throat> Srila Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur explains this point. He writes, The cause of the jiva being born and performing actions is his previous karmas. This is caused by maya. What is the cause of the Lord's birth and actions? Except for mercy, mayam, for the jivas, atma, of the Lord, atmana, there is no reason. There's no reason for Krishna's activities, Janma Karma, Chamejivyam, except mercy. According to Vishra Prakasha, Maya can mean mercy as well as deceit. Certainly, we undergo deceit in the whole package of material existence. But where's the mercy? 
The result of his mercy is his birth and activities. By showing his birth and activities, all the jivas can be delivered. The Lord is capable of doing this because he is the most excellent. The cause of his mercy is that he's the witness of the jivas. Remember the verse from the Upanishad, often quoted, Upadrasta and Anumanta. The Lord is the overseer and the witness. Seeing, Vishwanath Chakri Thakur points out, seeing the jivas who have fallen into the ocean of suffering through repeated birth. That's the cause of Krishna's mercy. He's the witness. He's watching. He's active. He's proactive. He comes. He sends his representatives. But because we're so dull, we become angry. If there is God, why are we suffering? Why does he do something about it? He is doing something about it. But we're so envious and stubbornly attached that we don't take advantage. <clears throat> Text 58. The Supreme Personality of God acts through his material energy in the creation, maintenance, and annihilation of this cosmic manifestation just to deliver the living entity by his compassion and stop the living entity's birth, death, and duration of materialistic life. Thus he enables the living being to return home back to Godhead. He acts in creation, maintenance, and annihilation just to deliver the living entity by his compassion and stop the whole package of material existence. And in this purport, Srila Prabhupada echoes a point we've been discussing, or we're echoing a point <laughs> he's given us, Materialistic men sometimes ask why God has created the material world for the suffering of living entities. And then Prabhupada affirms, the material creation is certainly meant for the suffering of the conditioned souls. Oh no. Who are part of the Supreme Personality of Godhead as confirmed by the Lord himself in Bhagavad Gita. Both the Lord, we're jumping ahead in the purport, both the Lord and the living entity, being qualitatively spirit soul, have the tendency for peaceful enjoyment. In other words, what we're doing now is not peaceful enjoyment. We think we're just innocently gratifying our senses and fulfilling our material objectives, that's not being peaceful. That's being warlike. We're uncooperative, rebellious, exploitative. We discussed some days ago about how comma, material desire, in a sub-step that occurs before the next full step, which is anger, the sub-step is con conflict of interest. Remember we discussed this? Contemplating the objects of the senses. Then there's attachment. Then there's lust. And then there's anger. But we discussed how Srila Bhakti Sananda Sarasitaka inserts in between lust and anger, a sub-step, conflict of interest. And it requires some thought. Because we think, well, I have desires, you have desires... Uh, There'll be fulfillment, there'll be peace, there'll be satisfaction. No. What the material energy doesn't allow you to see at first until afterwards is that there will be a conflict of interest. There cannot be peace and harmony through material gratification, exploitation, futile attempts at satisfaction. There always must ensue conflict of interest as a substep and then 
anger as the next full step. Tough lesson for human beings to learn. Because our knowledge is covered by avidya, nescience, we don't see this. And even afterwards, when we experience distress, we still can't understand what hit us. In the present coronavirus crisis, are, how much are you hearing that we have a problem with animals? Sometimes, if you're listening to educated sources, sources meant for educated persons, you'll hear about zoonic pathogens, pathogens that have jumped from animal species to human beings. But very rarely will you hear that, hey, guess what? How did they jump? Because human beings are where they shouldn't be and eating what they shouldn't be eating and imprisoning in mass animals in such a cruel and cramped way that there's so much disease among the animals. You don't hear that very often, but the point should be made. We're suffering from the wrath of animals. And of course, behind all that is material nature. Punishing human beings for not living according to their true purpose. We'll go back to that purport. Both the Lord and the living entity, being qualitatively spirit soul, have the tendency for peaceful enjoyment. But when the part of the Supreme Personality of Godhead unfortunately wants to enjoy independently without Krishna, he is put into the material world where he begins his life as Brahma and is gradually degraded to the status of an ant or a worm in stool. This is called Manashastanindriyani Prakriti Stani Karshati. There's a great struggle for existence because the living entity, conditioned by material nature, is under nature's full control. Prakate kriyamanani gunai karmani sarvasha. Now, please focus on this point because every point is so valuable and profound and deep. You can read it every point over and over again. But tonight, especially Think about this one. Because of his limited knowledge, however, the living entity thinks he is enjoying in this material world. A knowledge problem, an information problem. Yes, even in the 21st century. I think to enjoy the material world because my knowledge is limited. And why is my knowledge limited? First of all, I'm a tiny living entity. And on top of my being tiny, my knowledge has been curtailed by the avijja shakti, the nation's potency, due to my perverted desires, artificial desires. So it's interesting. I mean, how often have we thought about this? Why do I want to enjoy the material? Because I have limited knowledge. I don't know enough. I don't have the right information. And I'm so tiny, I can be overwhelmed by the illusory energy unless I take shelter of Krishna. So this information in Srimad Bhagavatam is exhilarating in its potential to free us from the virus that's really causing all the havoc. <clears throat> because of the suffering we undergo in material existence, out of compassion, Krishna appears. 
and he appears and gives instruction. He creates this material world out of compassion to give us a chance to understand our real position. So again, you'll say, wait a minute, out of compassion? Look, people are dying, people are suffering. Hospitals are horribly overloaded. But we shouldn't overlook the opportunity that we have for understanding our real position. As Srila Prabhupada writes further in this purport, every conditioned soul is struggling, but human life provides the best chance for him to understand his position. The false life of repeated birth and death must be stopped, and the conditioned soul should be educated. This is the purpose of creation. Every conditioned soul is struggling. The Acharyas present that even Brahma is struggling. It's inconceivable to us. I like this example. Brahma thinks I'll be happy in the position of Brahma by creating a universe. The ant thinks I'll be happy by finding a hole in the wall and making a home. It's hard for us to understand, but it's the same psychology. We're trying to carve out a niche for ourselves in the wrong place, whether we're Brahma or the ant. In the coming days, we're going to speak about how to make the best use of the human body and human existence. Because sometimes people think, oh, you just condemn, condemn, condemn. We've got these bodies. Didn't God give us these bodies to enjoy? <laughs> okay, if you think that, then go, go enjoy it. Let's see the enjoyment. We're so desperate that just a few drops of so-called material happiness and we get so excited oh. meanwhile material nature shows us reality again and again that's why i pointed out at the beginning of our talk that plagues epidemics pandemics have always been around yet we can't even remember 2009 and 2010 in the USA, when 240,000 people were hospitalized. And was it 12 or 14,000 were dead in one year in just the USA? Ah, ancient history, remote antiquity. In the material world, the conditioned soul is given a chance to satisfy his senses, but at the same time, he is informed by Vedic knowledge that this material world is not his actual place for happiness. Uh, who, can, who can really accept that? What do you mean it's not my actual place for happiness? What do you expect me to do? Chant Hare Krishna? <laughs> As I explained a few days ago, when there are so-called good times, prosperity, good weather, the money is flowing. You ask someone, chant Hare Krishna. Oh, well, I want to chant Hare Krishna. I'm good. I'm doing fine. <laughs> then when disaster strikes, chant Hare Krishna. How's that going to solve anything? Can't you see people are suffering? It's like we can't. <laughs> you can't win either way. People need to be educated what to do with their human form of life. 
hopefully human societies will get through this present crisis. But we don't want them to go back to business as usual. It's time to think about reorientating the entire human focus. Reconnecting it to that ancient bhakti wisdom. We can go deeper in our discussions of Krishna's mercy. The Acharyas point out that even when Mahavishnu glances over Prakriti, that glance is mercy and compassion. giving the living entities a chance to fulfill their desires while at the same time there is opportunity for education, for correction. But we just stress the suffering side because we're so angry that our materialistic plans and schemes are spoiled. So we forget all about the educational reformation side. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur explains, The Lord's mercy consists of glancing over Maya, thinking, Let the jivas get their material enjoyment after attaining material intelligence and senses. But someone may ask, but How can this be mercy? The jivas, by enjoying material objects and undergoing creation, maintenance, and destruction of the universe, simply experience suffering. But the Lord acts in such a way that the jivas become detached from the world and its enjoyments. He acts only because of mercy and compassion. And that mercy and compassion is especially demonstrated when Radha and Krishna combine as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. I've been thinking about this next verse. We'll skip ahead a few verses. Text 61. You see, it's not that Krishna in his appearance as Swayam Bhagavan is only merciful to those who were present at that time. He's also merciful to those jivas appearing in the future. How is that? Let's hear from Shukadev Goswami. Kalo Janishyamananam Dukkha Shoka Tamonudam Anugrahaya Bhaktanam Supunyam Vyatanod Yasaha To show causeless mercy to the devotees who would take birth in the future in this age of Kali. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, acted in such a way that simply by remembering him, one will be freed from all the lamentation and unhappiness of material existence. In other words, he acted so that all future devotees, by accepting the instructions of Krishna consciousness stated in Bhagavad Gita, could be relieved from the pangs of material existence. So Shukadeva Goswami has described the Lord's mercy for devotees present at the time of his appearance and also he's describing the Lord's mercy for persons in the future. That means us. He's acting in such a way that simply by remembering what he does will be freed from all the lamentation and unhappiness of material existence. There is lamentation, there is unhappiness, there is suffering, 
But he acts in such a way that we'll be freed from all that. But still we complain and we have no time to hear about how he's acting. We have no time to properly dedicate to hearing the name, form, qualities, and pastimes of Krishna. This is our problem. We've talked about bhava. Let's dip a bit into bhava. You know about how when Krishna's devotees in Vrindavan look at him, they curse the creator for the disturbance caused by the momentary blinking of their eyes. That state in which they actually feel that way, we recite that verse, but to actually feel the transcendental emotion is not available for all, even residents of Vrindavan. We'll read the verse as Shukadeva Goswami recites it. Yashyananam makara kundala charu karna brajak kapola subagam suvilas sabilasa hasam nityotsavam natatrapur drishibir pibantyo naryo narascha mudita kupita nameshcha. Krishna's face is decorated with ornaments such as earrings resembling sharks. His ears are beautiful, his cheeks brilliant, and his smiling attractive to everyone. Whoever sees Lord Krishna sees a festival. His face and body are fully satisfying for everyone to see. But the devotees are angry at the Creator for the disturbance caused by the momentary blinking of their eyes. So Shukadeva Goswami is giving you a hint because he's about to end this ninth canto and the reader is going to embark upon the tenth canto. This problem with blinking eyes is the property of only the gopis in terms of the ladies of Vrindavan. Their inability to tolerate the blinking of their eyes, they became angry with the Creator. This is Ruta Mahabhava. It's there also among the men in Braj, but only Krishna's most intimate friends, Priyanarma Sakas, such as Subala. In other words, it's possible only for the gopis and these most intimate cowherd boys, the Priyanarma Sakas, to have Buddha Mahabhava. Definitely Shukadeva Goswami is preparing us. What a way to end the ninth canto. We'll take a look at Bhakti Rasamri to Sindhu. I'm working hard trying to coordinate its publication. As I explained some days ago, it'll be five volumes of a thousand pages. 
The part I'm working on now is where Rupa Goswami describes Krishna's qualities. And every devotee should be interested in being mesmerized by Krishna's qualities. This is personalism, name, form, qualities, and pastimes. So you know that there are 64 qualities. They're in four divisions. The first division has 50 qualities. The second five, the third five, and the last four. You know those last four that only Swayam Bhagavan, Krishna in his original form, reveals. Prema Madhurya, Venu Madhurya, Lila Madhurya, Rupa Madhurya. The sweetness of his flute, his beauty, his loving associates, his pastimes. Where do these examples come from when you read Nectar Devotion? You may recall, I hope, that you do read Nectar Devotion. For each of those qualities, 64, Rupa Goswami gives an example. The Acharyas describe that these examples derive from four kinds of authoritative statements. Number one, scriptural passages, the actual verses. Number two, scriptural purports. Number three, famous words of great devotees words they've spoke that are in line with the purport of the scriptures. And number four, statements that are in agreement with all the above. You can take these four kinds of authoritative statements and group them into two categories. Those statements that astonish by presenting aspects of Krishna as the Lord and those that astonish by presenting Krishna's human-like pastimes. In other words, even though Krishna is Swayam Bhagavan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, his human-like pastimes also cause astonishment. Supporting evidence is given from Bhagavatam 10th Cano, chapter 50, text 29. For him who orchestrates the creation, maintenance, and destruction of the three worlds, and who possesses unlimited spiritual qualities, it is hardly amazing that he subdues an opposing party. Still, when the Lord does so, imitating human behavior, sages glorify his acts. In other words, it's hardly amazing that we just celebrated Ramchandra's appearance day, that Ramchandra defeats Ravana. It is hardly amazing that Krishna causes the annihilation of Jarasandha's armies 17 times. What is amazing is that Krishna does it in a human-like way. He doesn't appear as Mahavishnu. No, Naralila, human-like pastime. And because he is unlimited and inconceivable, even though you know the outcome of the pastime, you're still attracted, you're still caught up, and it's ever fresh. You can go on hearing about it eternally. Nityotsava, it's an eternal festival. This is how expert Krishna is. Does he need to do anything? No. It's an expression of his love. Let me give my devotees pastimes to relish. 
We'll go to the 14th verse of the 10th canto. Excuse me. Chapter 14, 10th canto, verse 37. This is spoken by Brahma in his prayers. Spoken after the Brahma Vimohana Leela, the bewilderment of Lord Brahma. My dear master, although you have nothing to do with material existence, you come to this earth and imitate material life just to expand the varieties of ecstatic enjoyment for your surrendered devotees. You come just to expand the varieties of ecstatic enjoyment. That's mercy. I wanted to read you something about Krishna's Kastuba gem. One of his qualities is possessing vitality. And that can refer to such an effulgence. Rupa Goswami explains, though the king of jewels, Kastuba, mocks with its shining rays, even when the sun multiplies. Still, it appears like only a star on Lord Hari's dazzling chest. So here you have the Kostuba Jew, which normally is more effulgent than the sun multiplied many times over. Yet, when Krishna appears in this world, that Kostuba gem seems to be just like a star that happens to be on the dazzling chest of Lord Krishna. So what goes on here? Ah, something very interesting. Jiva Goswami explains that during Krishna's Bomalila, he hides his effulgence of his body. And he hides the effulgence of the Kostuba gem. In that way, his pastimes, his Naralila, is amplified. By Krishna's toning down, so to speak, his own effulgence and the effulgence of the Kostuba gem. This allows the effulgence of the sun and other luminaries to, to be visible in his pastimes. And you could, as Jiva Goswami points out, trace this phenomenon to Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna says, Naham Prakasha Sarvasya Yoga Maya Samavrata. Covered by Yoga Maya, I do not illuminate everything. Very interesting. Just to magnify his Naralila, his human like pastimes, he tones down his effulgence from his body and from the Kostuba gem. Otherwise, it'd be too much. <laughs> what would be the need of the sun and the moon? <laughs> So he tones down that Kastuba gem so it appears just like a star. <laughs> Rather than like the sun multiplied many times. Krishna wants to make everything sweet for his intimate devotees.
Krishna is also very expert. Chatura. He can solve many problems by doing just one thing. Listen to how Rupa Goswami explains that. Krishna looked splendid as he gave bliss to the herd of cows by singing cowherd songs. That's number one. Giving bliss to the herd of cows by singing cowherd songs. Number two. Same time, simultaneously, he pleases the gopis by the waves of his sidelong glances. Number three. Simultaneously, cowherd boyfriends. He gladdens his cowherd boyfriends by his courageous wrestling. All this is going on in the presence of Aristasura. <laughs> Ready to attack. In other words, <laughs> Krishna is showing Aristasura, you demon, I couldn't care less about you. <laughs> I'm giving bliss to the herd of cows. I'm pleasing the gopis. I'm gladdening my friends. <laughs> I'm doing all this fearlessly, even though you're in my sight. And I'm also showing you that I'm bestowing fearlessness upon my cows, my gopis, and my friends. This is expertise. Then we have something about Deshakala Supatra Gya. This quality of Krishna refers to understanding perfectly what to do, how to handle a particular place, a particular time, and a particular well-qualified person. Rupa Goswami explains, knowledge about proper time, place, and person. The expert judge of place, time, and person is one who performs actions suitable to all those. So Jiva Goswami explains that actually the most important factor is Supatra, the well-qualified person. Otherwise, what's the use of the time? What's the use of the place? They have little value in the absence of a qualified person. What's a very nice illustration of how Krishna is so expert, Desha Kala Supatra Gya. Yeah. He understands exactly what to do. The illustration is about Rasa Leela, particularly the autumn Rasa Leela. Wednesday, by the way, is, at least in New Zealand, is Krishna's spring. Rasalila time. It's also simultaneously the day of Balaram's Rasalila. We'll be speaking a little bit about that on Wednesday. But let's hear Rupa Goswami's illustration of this quality of Krishna, which he's so expert at doing the most perfect thing in terms of place, time, and well-qualified person. There is no time compared to the moonlit autumn night. There's no place of amusement in the three worlds that equals Vrindavan. And no lotus-eyed women there are no lotus-eyed women who could compare to the young gopis of Braj. Considering all this, my heart, Krishna says, longs for the taste of the rasa dance. What a beautiful example of expertise in time, place, and qualified person.
No time compared to an autumn night, no place compared to Brindavan, and no persons to compare to the lotus-eyed young gopis of Braj. Therefore, conclusion, my heart longs for the taste of the rasa dance. Last point. You may recall how in the beginning we gave an example of material existence, the fly stuck in the honey. <clears throat> the fly is allured, attracted by a piece of honey-covered toast. And, of course, the fly is finished. This is the story of our material existence, and we repeat it birth after birth. Just like I pointed out to you in our discussions of bhava, material existence, the repetition of birth and death. How this is not the first time this coronavirus situation has hit humanity. Epidemics, pandemics are always coming. You stop this one, the next one comes. But we have made things even more complicated than what material existence normally is by our exploitation of the animal kingdom. Remember, 75% of emerging infectious diseases stem from human beings' inordinate contact with animals. 75%. Where are the plans to stop that improper, inordinate, exploitative contact with animals? Who's talking about that? You stop COVID-19, along comes COVID-29. It goes on and on. This is the nature of being stuck in the false attractiveness of material nature. As Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Prakriti Stani Karshati. We're stuck in the oppressive material atmosphere and we're suffering. As we try to manipulate the world with our senses and mind. But there's another way to be stuck. This example is given by Rupa Goswami and Bhakti Rasamri to Sindhu. He writes, if the bee-like eyes of the gopis land upon one of the eight lotus-like bodily parts of Krishna, the enemy of the Dhanavas, they will not be able to take off from the thick honey of his beauty. <laughs> you can just visualize the eyes of the gopis, which are like bees, landing upon just one of Krishna's eight lotus-like bodily parts. They can't, these bee-like eyes can't take off. They can't leave. They're stuck in the thick honey of Krishna's beauty. You may wonder, what are the eight lotus-like bodily parts of Krishna. Face, two eyes, navel, two feet, and two hands. But everything about Krishna is lotus-like. So these eight simply represent, Jiva Goswami says, all the bodily parts. That thick honey of his beauty and the bee-like eyes of his most precious devotees cannot remove themselves. They can't take off and fly away. Isn't that beautiful? We'll continue this discussion on Wednesday and we look forward to speaking with you then. 
Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.